Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Delphi Economic Forum. Welcome to another session. We're talking about <coughs> economy, uh, and we're talking about Greek economy, because our uh, session is entitled uh, Necessary Steps for a Powerful Greek Economy. And we know that in the last years, the Greek economy suffered a lot, uh, suffered a, a big crisis with memoranda, then the pandemic, now the war. So what is the situation now, and what are the prospects? Uh, we will analyze all of that uh, with our well-esteemed guests. Uh, I will start with uh, Mr. Joaquin Almunia. He is the chairman of the board of the Center for European Policy Studies. Mr. Almunia, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Zolt Darvas, he is a senior fellow at Bruegel Institute. Mr. Darvas, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, Mr. Uh, Dimitris Omokos, he is a professor at said uh, Business School and said Edmund Hall at the University of, of Oxford. Thank Mr. Somokos, for welcome. <coughs> Mr. Napoleon Marvegas unfortunately met COVID, and we all uh, wish that uh, he will get uh, well soon. Uh, so he will not uh, be with us today. Mr. Almunia, I will start with you, and uh, I will ask you, at first, you were the one who presented the ESM evaluation report on uh, the financial assistance given uh, to Greece. And what has happened since then? Do you feel that? Um, the wounds of uh, the, the Greek economy are healed, or uh, we're far from that? Yes, I, I was uh, charged by the board of the ESM, it means the finance ministers of the euro area, to chair the evaluation report, the second evaluation report, covering from 2011, the private sector involvement, until the end of the third program, the ESM program, that was the end of uh, 18, around the end of 18. So this evaluation report considered that uh, the situation after the three programs had clearly improved in, in Greece, but not all the uh, things that were done from both sides, the Eurogroup uh, member side and the Greek uh, authorities, were uh, well done. So the report is quite critical on how things were done, defining the objectives or badly defining the objectives of the programs, the uh, number of uh, conditions imposed to the Greek authorities in exchange of their efforts for fiscal adjustment, the lack of uh, uh, structural reforms combined with the fiscal adjustments, the lack of ownership, political ownership, but all in all, the main objectives of the programs were covered. It means the integrity of the euro area was preserved and the presence of Greece in the euro area was at risk because of some voices here in Greece, but also because of some other voices in Berlin, for instance. But finally, the integrity of the euro area was preserved and the stability of the Greek economy has clearly improved thanks to the programs, but many things were still pending. Uh, in uh, June 2020, when the ministers of the board of the ESM adopted my recommendations, in my recommendations there was a, a list, there were a list of uh, things to be done in the coming years that are, are now being done Beside or despite the difficulties, despite the difficulties of the pandemic, despite the difficulties now of the energy prices uh, rising to the roof and the consequences on our economies. But all in all, until June 2020, the global assessment was positive, clearly positive, but there were criticisms that were not hidden in my, in my report. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, do you feel uh, an additional question. Do you feel, uh, you told us that uh, the presence of uh, Greece in Eurozone was in doubt. Do you feel that now it's um, safe and uh, this is uh, a, final, uh, a final answer to this question? The presence of? The, the presence of Greece in the Eurozone. Yes, of course. <clears throat> the, the integrity of the Euro area was not only preserved in June 2020, has been clearly strengthened because of the new instruments that equipped the tux, tux, uh, toolbox of the, of the euro area 
and because of the political awareness about the need to, as uh, Draghi said uh, famously, whatever it takes to preserve the euro and the integrity of our monetary union. Mr. Darvas, after austerity in memoranda, uh, Greece has now succeeded the recovery plan, which is um, a bit overthrown by the pandemic and now the war in Ukraine. What is the difference of this plan uh, compared to other countries? So Greece got an enormous chance and opportunity with the recovery and resilience facility and more generally with the, with the next generation EU because the country will get over 12% of its annual GDP from this fund in terms of grants, which is an enormous amount. In addition, it will also get 6.8% uh, in, in terms of loans. So altogether, about almost 20% almost of annual GDP will flow to Greece in the, I mean, in the six-year period from, from 21 to, to, to 26. And I mean, this is an enormous opportunity, but I also have to say this is an enormous challenge. Now, let me recall that, you know, since Greece has been a member of the, of the, of the European community and then the EU since the 1980s, Greece received a lot of EU structural funds, about two or three percentage points of GDP in each year. Yet, when I, when I look at academic research evaluating what the impact of this very large structure fund inflow to the Greek economy was, then some research even concludes that it had a negative impact, not, not even a neutral and, and certainly not, not positive. Now, any such calculation is certainly, certainly questionable, but I think it's, it's fair or clear to say that, that in the past, Greece faced major challenges in, good, in a good use of, of European Union money. Now, with the recovery fund, I mean, I also had a lot of discussion with, with Greek officials, uh, and I also looked at the Greek plan. I know a lot of you know, new efforts have been put in place to use this money in a much <coughs> better way than European Union money was, was used in the past. Nevertheless, I think the challenge, challenge remains, and you know, this money not just have, have to be spent, but have to be spent well. For example, there was also a report by the European Court of Auditors which looked at the, the regular uh, uh, implementation of, of the regular seven-year multi-annual EU, EU budget. And it was very critical that when countries and with the help of the European Commission tried to accelerate the absorption of the EU fund, then the goal was just to spend the money and naturally on, uh, on, on, on spending well. So the value for money was not naturally really considered. So I think in the, in the case of Greece, uh, Currently, the big challenge is to improve the administ administrative capacity at all levels of the government, you know, not just the central government, which I think uh, is, is well equipped at the moment, but all lower levels of the, of the government to, to implement this fund um, well. And, you know, if you look at, you know, the, the composition, I mean, so the composition of, 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 of Greek plan is, is much more diverse than, let's say, the plans of, of, of Germany or, or Denmark. And the reason is very simple. Germany and Denmark get a relatively small amount of money uh, as a share of their GDP. So they want to have a more concentrated uh, uh, spending priority, maybe to spend a little money on, on, a, on a few big priorities to, to achieve results. Why Greece plan is much more widespread, which is again both a, uh, an advantage but, but also a, a risk that, that uh, if, you, if implementation has to focus on many, many different areas, uh, then it can, be, it can be tricky. And certainly there's a lot to improve. <clears throat> For example, I looked at in a bit more detail the digital components of the plans. And if you look at you know, where Greece is currently ranking in terms of, let's say, simple things like digitalization of, of public services, uh, digitalization of, of businesses, digital skills, uh, R&D in, in, in digital areas, then Greece ranks almost the worst or, or in, in all, all cases, the, the worst three among European Union countries. So the gap to fill is enormous. Now, as I said, the recovery fund offers a, a great opportunity, but the challenge of spending the money well must be, must be met wisely. Mr. Zomokos, we're talking about the improvement of uh, Greek economy, and uh, I'd like to ask you, how can you describe this significant improve, improvement of the Greek economy? And 
what are the reforms? We're talking, even the government talking about um, reforms. What are these reforms um, uh, which can be, uh, would be made uh, to, um, uh, to add a, a, a value to uh, the Greek economy? First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us. And before I talk about the future, uh, I would like to emphasize a little bit about the past. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting. The predecessor, or actually the successor of Joachim, has admitted to many mistakes of the Greek austerity plan. And the academic community and the policy circles abroad have now admitted that the punitive nature of the program that was imposed in Greece had debilitating impact both in GDP, 29% decrease, it is, I think, the largest decrease of GDP in such a short time during peace times, comparable to the Great Recession. 475 uh, highly skilled labor from the ages of 25 to 40 emigrated from Greece. Uh, uh, Deindustrialization of a great degree, and I can unemployment, youth unemployment, and so on and so forth. Therefore. Uh, to say that this program was a success story, uh, it's nothing, in my humble opinion, further from the truth. Now, given what happened in the global financial crisis, then we had the second crisis, which was the pandemic. The pandemic created a supply side shock. And after the widening gap between the North and the South in the European Union, and that gap that has so successfully been closed by the original founders of the European Economic Community in the European Union, and I'm talking about Jacques Delors, François Mitterrand, uh, Helmut Kohl, then this widening gap basically had weakened the economies of the South, and then we had the supply shock from the pandemic and the collapse and the dismantling of the international and the global uh, supply uh, chain, and hence now we have almost all the elements of the perfect storm. And plus, and this applies primarily for Greece and Portugal to some extent, the private debt has increased considerably. Uh, for example, the Greek combined private and sovereign debt before uh, the global financial crisis was below the EU average. Now, not only is above the EU average, but the uh, debt uh, the sovereign debt has increased as a percentage of the GDP. Likewise, the private debt and the corporate debt and the non-performing assets have uh, increased considerably. The same applies to a lesser extent because the program, the austerity program, was not as punitive as it was in Greece. Applies to Portugal uh, and not to Ireland, who negotiated more staunchly. And then, to top it all up, uh, we have now the Ukrainian war. In the Ukrainian war basically enhanced, enhanced the supply, the negative supply shock of the pandemic, accelerated the de-dollarization de of uh, uh, the international financial transactions with the sanctions, and more importantly, uh, started decimating the international, the international transport system and further disabling uh, the international supply chain. Hence, Given this dire situation, uh, and given the fact that Greece has neither the fiscal capacity due to the enhanced surveillance, uh, and in my opinion, and as uh, a Yale graduate and a professor at Oxford, a stone Keynesian, uh, during crisis and during recessions, we are all Keynesians, and during inflationary and expansionary periods, we are all monetarists, uh, I believe we need both fiscal expansion, fiscal transfers, yes, fiscal transfers via eurobonds, relaxation of this stringent, punitive, and obsolete, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, fiscal rules during this kind of an extreme crisis, and expansionary monetary policy. Because now the sanctions that have been imposed and the higher energy costs they will jeopardize not only the financial stability of the Eurozone, but also the price stability. We are facing now inflation, 
we are placing uh, misalignment of investment and savings, lower savings, more consumption to healthcare with the aging population, that's the famous good health argument. Hence, we have to take immediately remedial act and we shouldn't do the usual European policy of kicking the can down uh, the road and if you will, if I'm allowed to say so, emulate what Janet Yellen, Powell, and above all, Bern Bernanke did the last decade. Aggressive, expansionary liquidity provision and investment uh, incentives of internationally traded goods in order first to stabilize the upcoming crisis, that uh, supply side crisis, and the humanitarian crisis that may emanate from the war, and also start closing the increasing gap uh, in GDP per capita between the North and the South. Otherwise, uh, I'm afraid uh, that this crisis, uh, this multiple crisis, uh, will self-perpetuate, self and we may start talking not about the Fisherian debt deflation <coughs> years, but we may start talking now about the secular stagnation of Alvin Hansen. It's in, uh, at our disposal to reverse this by using all of the available tools. And now the European Union, if we judge about the funds of the pandemic, has come to some realization of being more aggressive and more expansive in order to counteract uh, the negative externalities of three overlapping crises within the last 15 years. Well, Mr. Amulia, uh, coming back to you and taking into account uh, what we had earlier, uh, do you feel that austerity was not the answer to the problems of the Greek economy, and especially in the, uh, in the years of the big crisis, in the begin at the beginning of the crisis, at 2009, 2010? Or it was the appropriate uh, way to, to solve these problems? Well, in my view, <clears throat> in 2010, when the uh, financial crisis became a public debt and private debt crisis vis-à-vis -vis the markets, the question was not about austerity, yes or no. Austerity, in the case of Greece, with more than 100% public debt to GDP ratio, the highest together with Italy in the whole EU, and with a, a strong lack of trust of public authorities around Europe and investors in the conditions and the, in the uh, positive aspects of the Greek economy, austerity was absolutely needed. The question was the intensity of austerity. And it's obvious, and in, in the report, we, we signal this very clearly, even if some of those who have protagonized austerity decisions was, were around the table, but I insisted Austerity was too intense from many points of view, first. Second, the adjustment path was uh, non-viable, was too short. The IMF was used to have three years of uh, adjustment in the fiscal programs, but in the case of Greece, during the financial crisis and with the public debt crisis, Greece needed less intensity of the fiscal adjustment, mm -hmm. more gradual adjustment, combined with other measures. But in the first program, the obsession was austerity as much as possible and as soon as possible. And this was clearly wrong. Gradually, this uh, conscience of the error of austerity uh, was admitted both here in Athens, but also in Brussels, Frankfurt, Berlin, Paris, or wherever. The problem was that uh, there were not only uh, fiscal measures that were needed, there were structural reforms and to create trust, confidence, for the private investors to come back. And they did not come back because there was no trust, there was a lack of compliance on some important aspects by the Greek authorities here. I remember 2014, for instance, the year before the Tsipras arrival to government. The Samaras government was meant 
to sign the conclusion of the second program, and because the elections were coming and the political conditions were not very favorable for uh, his party, he didn't sign, and this created a regression in trust, in the trust degrees in confidence, and, of course, the first uh, Tsipras government with Varoufakis as financial minister was terrible. So all the gains that were, with a lot of efforts, accumulated in the Greek economy disappear in six months. So austerity was needed, yes, but, a big but. And in the, in the report we say, okay, viable and reasonable and credible fiscal adjustment plus structural reforms with the adequate sequencing between reforms and uh, fiscal adjustment decisions, political ownership, and to have political ownership in the Greek society, you need, of course, a good social equilibrium. So not only tough measures, cutting expenditures or increasing uh, taxes, but also social measures to give attention to the very deep and serious and terrible problems that the Greek society suffer here, in particular the weakest sectors of the Greek society. And on the other hand, from the point of view of the creditors, Germans and the others, confidence in the ownership by the Greek authorities of the conditions that they have signed in the programs. And this problem of confidence was very serious. It's not only about economic policy decisions, it's also about politics. And this lack of confidence triggered, for instance, the Wolfgang Schäuble uh, uh, demands for, Greek to for Greece to leave the euro area. That was terrible. Merkel uh, don't support this, but uh, at the beginning of the, this German position, mm -hmm. the integrity of the euro area was at risk again. Mr. Davas. Um, Can I comment? Of uh, course, of course. Yeah. My, my question is uh, relevant uh, in any case. Uh, the question is uh, if you feel that this trust, the Greek economy, is restored now effectively, and are you worried about what's coming with the public debt, um, inflation, or other uh, numbers? Now, before answering that, let me, let me connect my two fellow panelists who seem to be in, in disagreement on... On, on not necessarily. Not necessarily, okay. We but, have things to agree as well. Okay, but I'm, I'm closer to Mr. Armunia. I'm in you're this, interactive. <laughs> so in this sense, I'm closer to Mr. Uh, Armunia <coughs> in, this, in this sense, because if you look at the Greek economy up to 2008 and 9, I mean, it was clearly unsustainable. So what happened here in this country, <coughs> on fiscal side, on a lack of structural reforms, on, on, on the wasteful spending, that was absolutely, absolutely unsustainable. And, and adjustment had to be made. And indeed, the question was, I agree, not, not if, but, but at, at, at how much and, and when. But let me add a few comments on that. So, so I think another major mistake was, and this is mostly from the, from the European <coughs> Eurogroup and, and, and the Commission side, is that the debt restructuring was, was delayed and was, was uncertain, for quite long, uncertain for quite long. So that restructuring happened in 2020. And before that, I remember there was a year when everybody was talking about whether debt restructuring in Greece is needed or not. And again, when we had uh, you know, prominent commission officials uh, at, at Bruegel events, they said, no, no, no way debt restructuring, no way debt restructuring. And that created an enormous uncertainty because I think there was a general understanding that this level of Greek debt is, is not sustainable, that has to be, not just the flow has to be changed, you know, the budget deficit has to be cut, but something needs to be done to the, to the stock. And until a, a final decision was made that, okay, let's do a debt restructuring, a lot of time has passed that caused a lot of uncertainty, and certainly uncertainty is very bad for, for, for investment consumption and in, in, and in general economic development. So I think, that was a, more a mistake from the side of, of, of uh, Eurozone partners, because certainly Greece cannot say, please restructure my debt. I mean, it can, it can say as Argentina did, Argentina did, but, uh, but in an integrated Eurozone, certainly shouldn't the country initiate, but it, it's more a, 
responsibility of the, of the Eurogroup, in my view. My, my second comment on, on the past is that, again, when the adjustment, fiscal adjustment pass was, was designed, then uh, the gross assumptions were made overly optimistic. The IMF also had a, a very nice assessment of, of the various uh, adjustment programs and also concluded that yet, yes, it was, it was overly optimistic. Now, why it is a problem? Because if the adjustment pass is overly optimistic and GDP disappoints, then the country has to do more and more and more fiscal consolidation because if GDP is lower than what was assumed in the, in the, in the plan, then tax revenues are lower, so the budget deficit is larger, and all the budget deficit is, is fixed in nominal terms because the financing was provided in, in nominal terms, how many billion euros Greece will get from, from uh, year to year. Uh, so these overly optimistic assumptions basically put, put the country, the Greek, Greek country, unfortunately, in a, in a very adverse spiral where disappointment in GDP required further fiscal adjustment, which further lowered the GDP and further fiscal adjustment. So unfortunately, this, this spiral has, has evolved and, and uh, I think it also contributed additionally to the inevitable fall in output because there, some fall in output was inevitable, but it, it amplified, unfortunately, the, the fall. And, you know, why was assumption overly optimistic? I mean, it's very, very difficult to, to assess. Certainly one could be the reason that it was such a unique situation that a country in the Eurozone, uh, I mean, faces fiscal troubles, that it was, it was very difficult to, to plan and, and to, to make any, any projection. But also I have to say that if, a, if, if let's say, a, low, a more realistic or, let's say, a less ambitious output growth pass would have been assumed, then much more funding would have been needed. And, right. and you know, Eurogroup member states had, have, would have to agree, not the initial about 80 billion program, but uh, or at, at the start maybe twice of that amount or 50% or larger. And again, politically, that was also, also difficult. So there was a lot of also politics involved, I'm afraid, in the design of the, of the first program. And that indeed led to led to a, an amplifying recession in the, in the country. But again, I very much agree with you that, that it's, it's, it, it, fiscal adjustment was, was inevitable. I mean, the Greek public sector was in such in a dire state and, and in wasteful spending and large budget deficit that I think it was absolutely inevitable. Now, should I come to the present situation now or maybe in, a, in, a, in, a, in a next round? Um, uh, maybe in the next round. It's okay. better in the next round to be more interactive. Okay. Uh, but um, I, I, I'd like to be interactive too, and I'd like to, to ask you, Mr. Tsomokos, uh, after uh, this discussion, this round, do you feel a little vindicated about what you told at the beginning of the crisis? Actually, it's very interesting. <clears throat> it has been a very long time that I feel a minority. Nowadays, <laughs> I feel very boring and a majority because everybody agrees that this program was an ultimate failure. It was an example for textbooks to come how badly designed it was, even the IMF, in the minutes, they have agreed that when the program was enforced in Greece, they were planning to do the gradual adjustment without necessarily offloading government debt and reloading it to the Greek banks. And to have the numbers correct, up until 2012, the sum of private and public Greek debt was still below the EU average. It was the punitive, which had nothing to do with economics, because I'm an economist. Maybe Greece, the Greeks deserve to be done, to be subjected to worse tortures. But as an economist, bankruptcy is a fact of life, default is a fact of life. It's like sinist in theology. Regrettable, but present. Hence, instead of restructuring right away and trying to use the two legs of any IMF program, which is devaluation and structural reforms, because we did not have the chance of a devaluation. We did structural reforms, chopping the numerator of the GDP, of the debt to GDP ratio, and ignoring what would happen to the denominator. And what happened, and that's a fact, these are the numbers, 29%, and the debt was from 100%. By the way, Belgium had a higher debt than Greece at the time. It was not only Italy. Now, Greece has 200%. So, yes, when you kill the patient, then I suppose there is stability in the grave, however. Hence, at least, even Oliver Blanchard, 
has multiple times now written that they miscalculated the multipliers, but we argued against the then Troika, your successor, because on that I agree completely that in your tenure there was a greater appetite for the gradual and soft landing to adjustment, because adjustment was needed the same way that it was needed in Ireland, where the adjustment was much more gradual, and in Portugal, where the internal devaluation didn't take the extent that took in Greece. So it was obvious that Greece at the time was the guinea pig, and they were trying to set an example of a bad student so that nobody else to imitate Greece. If you want me to be a little bit political, I think politics trumped economics in that crisis. Had economics dominated and rational economic thinking, restructuring could have happened quite early, structural reform could have happened in a gradual and more targeted fashion, and Greece would have not been subjected to this traumatic experience that still has not come out of it. Of course, I, I'd like to ask you about the, the consequences of uh, the war in Ukraine, but I'm, I can say that uh, uh, you will take the pass directly. <laughs> yeah, because I will discuss this, uh, in my view, simple analysis of the public debt levels in Greece in 2010. Because it's true that Italy had more or less the same ratio, but what was the difference? The difference lied in two questions. First, and I referred to in my previous uh, intervention, lack of confidence in the public authorities in Greece and the way they were managing the economic situation that started with the financial crisis in, 28, in 2008. Lack of confidence that was transmitted not only in a very, very uh, tough uh, and, in my view, wrong uh, adjustment path, in positive uh, expectations regarding the impact on growth, why those positive expectations were not right, for two reasons. First, because none of the parties were interested in showing that the adjustment needed must be longer. None of them, not only the IMF tradition, but the creditors didn't want to pay too much or to lend too much. And the debtors here in Athens, they didn't want to show that the growth will not be recovered in five or six or seven years, as soon as possible. And the other point was the importance of financial markets, because till the beginning of the financial crisis, the financial markets had forgotten the risks embedded in public debt in the euro area. The spreads of Greece or Italy were 10 basis points above the spreads of Spain, and we have at that time 33 or 34% of public debt to GDP. But the differences, the risks were not there. Once the public debt in Greece had problems in 2010, the spreads went to the roof with contagion effects in other euro area countries. So the value of the public debt assets in the balance sheets of the Greek banks <laughs> decreased terribly. And the crisis was transmitted directly from the public debt crisis because of the loss of value to the balance sheets of the banks. And this created deeper problems for the Greek economy. They were not problems linked with fiscal authority. They were problems linked with the worsening of the, of the uh, balance of the banks that were not able to finance the Greek economy. So investment disappeared completely. And this uh, is a little bit more complex than the theory that we learn and we read in the textbooks. <laughs> One point, the credit spreads, if you recall, there was the summit between Sarkozy and Merkel in Deauville. That's when the spread across Europe started deviating. Deauville. Do yes. Yeah. Because that's when they yeah, the, said the, basically we're not. This, this was a mistake 
but the consequences in the different countries were completely Correct. different. Correct. So yes. it was not only <laughs> Greece. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Everybody made mistakes. <laughs> Mr. <True>. Davos, <laughs> a short comment on this. I, I would also add another difference that in 2009, you know, I think the, the initially planned budget deficit in Greece was around, I don't know, 3.6% or something like that. They started with 1.8 after 3.7. Then, 3 .7, then they did the 3.3 and a half, more or less, and then Heading to elections, it turned out that it might be somewhere six, and then it became. No, 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 no. It, 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 no, no. I, I presented no, to the to the, to the Eurogroup standard. finance ministers in July 29, uh, July 20, uh, 2009, so months before the election. I presented a non-public paper telling them public deficit in Greece right now will go above 10 percent at the end of this year, yeah. and the final figure that. Uh, the Papandreou government discovered was 13%, and the final, final figure, 15%. Yeah. But it started from, as you say, 15. one, then it went to three, and then six, then above, above 10. So there was clearly a major flow program. Uh, and, you know, in, in 2009, the Greek recession was relatively mild compared to, let's say, Germany mm -hmm. suffered much more uh, in, in 2009 from the, from the global crisis than, than Greece. So even a situation when the recession was not very, very, very serious, there was a huge budget deficit, and you know this was not the case in Italy or, or in, 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 in Spain or in other countries. So I think that's another major difference yeah. which, which suggested that an adjustment, you, if you have an excess 10% of GDP budget deficit in a year which is not very bad, I mean bad because GDP falls somewhat, but not very bad, I mean then a major adjustment I think was, was inevitable, but again as we agree, the timeline of that would have been much more gradual with more lending from from, uh, from creditors and, and also more upfront uh, debt restructuring. Now, the last round is dedicated to the war in Ukraine and uh, its consequences uh, to the economy. And uh, Mr. Almunia, beginning with you, I'd like to ask you if you, you think that uh, there's a bigger need now for common policies from the EU. Yes, indeed. Indeed, and I think now in a different situation than uh, 10 years ago, now most of the leaders and most of the finance ministers will agree on this. We need to complete the banking union, to have a real banking union that can help to finance the euro area economies, the private sector in particular, but also to share risks together with the capital markets union, and we need a more credible system or framework for fiscal surveillance. Fiscal surveillance is absolutely needed. We are in a monetary union with national budgets, so we need fiscal policy coordination. But uh, the old rules, now suspended, are not credible anymore. If sometime they were credible, not now. There will be a, a change. What kind of change, in my view, uh, a public expenditure rule, simple, uh, measured through observed variables, not through uh, calculations, uh, output gap, and uh, potential growth, and so on. And there will need to be a more reasonable and credible uh, adjustment for the public debt to GDP ratio forgetting 60% of GDP as a general rule. It depends on the conditions, it depends on the countries. Longer paths, and paths credible and viable because they will be, need, they will be linked to national commitments over the medium term, to structural reforms, and to uh, good behavior of the national uh, economy. I think this is the the framework for the new uh, fiscal rule systems. When it will come, in principle, <laughs> was expected to be in place at the end of this year, with the new rules coming into force again, beginning of uh, 2023. 20, uh, but now, with the consequences of the Ukrainian war and the uh, inflation and all these uh, things, 
I don't know to what extent it will be easy for finance minister mm -hmm. to reach an agreement uh, this year. Weakest, but uh, in, any case, in any case, the, the mood of finance ministers now regarding fiscal policy has changed. Weakest economies like the Greek economy are more vulnerable, are more exposed to, to all these dangers. Yes, because uh, the uh, Greek economy is more exposed because of the uh, big size of the public debt. It's true, as uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis said uh, this morning in this uh, same room, it's true that the conditions to repay the Greek public debt are very good, because they were negotiated late, I agree. The restructuring of the public debt should have come before the private sector involvement in 2011 or 2010 even, but was not possible then. But afterwards, it was possible to delay the repayment of the debt, to, to lower the uh, amount of the service of the debt, uh, the interest rates are, are uh, lower. So this will uh, strengthen the Greek uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the markets, together with the credibility mm -hmm. of the uh, public, uh, political economy of the, of the public authorities. And uh, I hope that together the uh, better conditions for the repayment of the debt and the uh, higher political confidence and the good behavior of the authorities will uh, protect Greece against uh, uh, similar risks that those uh, who suffered in the past. But uh, to deny the existence of risk, I think, is not realistic, it's not responsible. Mm -hmm. Mr. Darbas, what do you think, and an additional question is, uh, what do you predict about the energy crisis, the prices? Um, um, is there any chance, uh, apart from the war and uh, what's going on there, uh, is there any chance to, to end with this crisis at the end of the year or uh, 2023 will be also a difficult year? Now, first let me say that economists have been calling for higher energy prices for long including myself. So you're arguing that, you know, if the price of energy is, is cheap, then the incentive to decarbonize the economy is low. So basically, we were calling for years and years and years for higher energy prices. Now we have it, <laughs> and everybody is shocked and try to find, you know, measures to alleviate the, the burden on, on households, companies, companies alike. So it's a little bit weird situation, I, I, I have to say. I think high energy prices is good because we face a, a, a dramatic climate change outlook. If we don't act, then uh, the planet, large sh share of the planet will be uninhabitable in a couple of years with devastating impacts on, on, on people's life, on, on economy and so on. So I think energy prices have to be higher permanently. Now, so far we have reached indeed a very significant increase in energy prices and, and answering your question, uh, you know, I, what I think is that, you know, there was a level shift in energy prices in the past few months or, or, or quarters. But I think I wouldn't expect a similar further upward shift, let's say, from, from next year. But the continuation of this relatively high level of, of energy prices mm -hmm. going, going on in the, in, the, in the future. I mean, this means that, you know, the, the rate of inflation might slow down because there will be no further increase in energy prices, but energy prices will remain high. So, and we, we have to prepare for that, we have to, have to live for that. Uh, I think it's undoubtable that the poorest segments of the society need support because, I mean, many studies show that the poorest, let's say 20% of the society spends about half of their income on, on basically on energy and, 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 and food and, and both prices are, are going up, so certainly, the poorest people need support and, and, and uh, compensation for the higher energy prices. But, but for the other segments of the society, I mean, especially the rich, I mean, why do we want to support them with cheaper energy prices? I mean, they should, you know, heat their swimming pools, you know. If they heat their swimming pools, they have to pay, pay the price for that. It shouldn't be the, the general budget or taxpayers because if, if, if effectively, you know, if we support all across the board, lower energy prices for everyone. It means that everyone, including the poor, pays for the, the, the heated swimming pools in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in very rich households. So I think uh, a, a better fairness uh, would be needed when, when designing um, 
thinking about uh, energy price compensation. But now a few remark remarks on Greece uh, and also on the general inflation trend. So I, I said that I wouldn't expect you know, any, any further drastic increase in energy prices. Uh, now views differ. There was also a very interesting panel yesterday on inflation, whether in the more medium term inflation will, will go back closer to the target or, or, or not, either in Europe or in the US or, or, or globally. Uh, I'm more in favor of, of, the, of the view that, that, that I, I think this is indeed, I mean, many of the factors which kept inflation low <coughs> in the past will still, still be with us. Um, and in particular in Greece, if you look at Greece, you know, Greece had the lowest inflation among Eurozone countries in the past, I don't know, decade. Um, even if you look at core inflation, recent core inflation, in February it was 1.5% per year, so the inflation which excludes energy and food. Uh, it was 1.5% in Greece, in Germany it was 3. Uh, it went up a little bit in March, 2 point something. Uh, but still inflation is among the lowest in, in Greece. By unemployment is still 15%. Uh, and Greece needs, a, needs an, an adjustment. Before the, cri before the global crisis, Greece had too fast wage and, and, and price increases. Now we need to have the opposite, uh, which has happened effectively in the, in, the, in the past decade. And I also think that this will also keep, and the high unemployment will keep uh, inflation relatively low in Greece in the, again, after the energy shock prices is gone. But if, if you look at, you know, I, I just looked at also interest rates and interest rate expectations, uh, we see much more higher expected rates in Greece than let's say in, in Germany in the next three or four years. So clearly the real interest rate in, in Greece will be very more unfavorable than it is today. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I agree that with you that there are risks, and this is also a risk that if Greece would like to repay all the loans it obtained from, from other Eurozone facilities, then uh, it will need to pay a higher price for that in the, in the coming years. Thank you. We have uh, about three minutes left. Uh, Mr. Tsomokos, you have the last word. And um, apart from uh, a comment, a general comment about the prospects of the Greek economy uh, in, in the focus of uh, the, the developments uh, uh, in this and in Europe. Uh, and a, a comment about the highest interest rates, please. Let me escalate a little bit. In order to talk about high interest rates and high inflation that's here to stay, again, the academic community and the policy community agrees that as Goodhart said, interest rates will not be transitory and transient. Inflation will be high because the supply chain has been dismantled. And as an economist, I have to admit, I don't believe in moral uh, deliberations about how to restore the economic, and I don't believe in inevitabilities, particularly when it comes to dismantling societies and to uh, impoverishing uh, communities. Hence, Greece, likewise, as Ireland did, for example, during the dark days of austerity, should negotiate strongly and talk about credibility about the European partners as well, not only about the Greek government, because the European partners did never reveal that they were offloading Greek sovereign debt from the French and German banks to the Greek banks. So, in fact, when the restructuring occurred, it was the first bailout in the Eurozone, and that basically destroyed the Greek banking sector, and the Greek banking sector has not recovered. So Greece has to renegotiate the very comparative advantage of its economies. For example, successfully so, Spain and Portugal put price controls on energy. Greece has to be allowed to put price controls. Otherwise, there will not be an economy to regulate and to adjust if we don't do that. Number two, the transportation system nowadays will be dismantled because of the Ukrainian war. So imagine an embargo on Ukrainian uh, corn, uh, wheat, or fertilizers. Yes, what is the only remaining uh, asset that the Greek economy has? Shipping. That will dismantle shipping, and shipping will go. So, the very same way we are not moralistic and we are very economically minded for Spain, for Portugal, for Ireland, we have to stop beating the drums of morality for the Greek economy and 
in credibility and refer to credibility for both the European partners and the Greek partners. And in fact, that's the point I agree with, Joaquin, that for the first time, the European finance ministers have realized the severity of the situation and they want to coordinate for fiscal transfers and not punitive economic actions. Thank you. Well, Mr. Almunia, Mr. Darvas, Mr. Tsomokos, thank you for participating in this uh, session, in this discussion. Thank you all for attending and watching us. Thank you. Thank you.